Welcome back to class two. This, we are featuring Dr. Ann's uh, Way Less for Life book. In the first class, we covered the first five tips and tricks to help you lose weight and, and have a really healthy diet and stay very satisfied. And so today we're gonna pick up um, with number five. It is restrict your intake of fructose. And fructose is a slippery little devil. We've learned a lot about the way that the body man actually metabolizes and digests fructose. And it's, it's sneaky. And so fructose has gotten us into some trouble, um, not in small amounts, in real fruit. That is where fructose is a fruit sugar. Um, not in fresh fruit, but when it is in high fructose corn, corn syrup and when it is in just large amounts, period, um, it, does, it does create a difficult um, situation in the body. So what we know is um, of all the dietary culprits that underlie our current obesity crisis, fructose is singled out. Um, about eight years ago, there was a really nice study that was done at Baylor University, and they were able to link childhood obesity with um, an intake of soda and sugary beverages. And the reason that that is is because um, the soda manufacturers use high fructose corn syrup and there is a very strong link between soda consumption and obesity. And it, and it uh, is very, very high in the high fructose corn syrup that is used in soda. So we're currently consuming record amounts back in the old days when we were children. We may have a soda from time to time, but now people drink great big sodas from Quick Trip and fast food places and it really, really creates kind of a metabolic mess. We know that the intake of fructose can actually increase your food intake and I'm going to explain why. And it does not stimulate the release of insulin or leptin. And those are really, really important. Leptin is a hormone that your brain makes that actually makes you feel full. And when our blood, when we have insulin and when we eat protein and fat, that leptin is secreted and we have a very full feeling. But glucose or, or uh, fructose does not do that. And so when we have a lot of fructose in our diet in the way of soda or sweet food, it doesn't give us any kind of feeling of satiety. So this is how it breaks down. This is a really kind of a thumbnail sketch, but sucrose is table sugar and it would be considered a disaccharide. So sucrose is made up of two monosaccharides, one which is a molecule of glucose and the other is a molecule of fructose, okay? So when we eat something with sucrose in it, table sugar, what happens is it goes into the stomach and, and it starts to get digested. It gets to the bloodstream. And what you need to know about metabolism is the liver is the boss of fuel management. The liver has to control everything and decide everything. So once we have sucrose in our diet, in our stomach, and we start to break it down, the glucose can the, the glucose can go directly to the cell with the escort of insulin and can be burned. We burn fuel in every cell. The fructose, on the other hand, cannot go directly to the cell. It has to go to the liver. And once it's in the liver, when the blood sugar, when we already have fuel on board being burned in the cell, the liver has no other choice but to burn it as, or, but to store it as fat. Now it can bring it back out. It, we store it in the form of triglyceride. We can bring it back out and we can burn it later. But that is the whole, that is the, the devil in the deep blue sea about the high fructose corn syrup is that we can burn some of it, but some of it we have to store. So that is why fructose um, is really, really dangerous for us in high amounts. Now, when having said that, when we think of fructose, we always think of fruit. And one orange has, you know, 60 calories. That is not harmful for us. We can manage that. The liver can figure out how to manage that. But when we drink sodas that are this big and we have lots and lots of sweet foods and lots of sugary cereals and sugar in everything, that is when it gets us in trouble because we simply cannot burn it as fast as it comes into the bloodstream. 
So, of all the dietary culprits, we know that fructose is really dangerous in terms of obesity. We know that the intake of fructose can actually increase your, increase your food intake because it doesn't give us that, that feeling of satiety. It doesn't, it doesn't um, stimulate the leptin, which actually makes us feel full. We also know that um, when we do these kinds of things, avoid sugary beverages, avoid intake of dessert foods and sweets, have fruit to be your dessert instead of cake and pie, steer clear of sugary cereals, and just be really, really aware of where you get fructose. It is in ketchup, it is in salad dressing, it is in many, many things. We, food manufacturers put it in a lot of things and so it's just really good to be aware of how much, it, how much is in there and how much you're eating of it because it's, it sneaks right in. For example, I mean look at all of, this is, this is um, uh, teaspoons of sugar. So uh, there are 12 teaspoons of sugar in cranberry, an 8 ounce glass of or 12 ounce portion of cranberry juice. Orange soda has 11. Orange juice has 10. Cola has 10. So that's, I mean, would you take tea, 10 teaspoons of sugar and put it in a cup of coffee or a glass of iced tea? Probably not. So it really sneaks into a lot of foods. And even though cranberry juice and orange juice, we don't think of them as bad foods, it is far better for us to eat our fruit than to drink our fruit. When we eat our fruit, we have a lot of fiber and fiber slows that whole process down. So, so these are just um, examples of how much sugar is in food. Um, this is the new target for the food industry is to have three teaspoons of, of sugar in food. And then these are things that are um, very low and much better. Coffee, mineral water, plain water, tea, plain. So it, that just gives you an idea of how much sugar is in food. It's a lot, there's a lot of sugar in food. We really don't need it. So the summary is just, just restrict your intake of fructose. That is not to say that you need to reduce your amount of fruit that you eat, but the high fructose corn syrup and the sugar that is in food is really, really um, creates an environment of being able to store fat. One of the, the, the things that people tell me, you know, when they have success with losing weight, I'll say, you look great. What did you do? How did you lose your 10 pounds or your 20 pounds? And they say, I stopped eating sweets. I cut soda out of my diet. Happens. Happens every time. Sugar is very, very difficult in large amounts for us to metabolize and burn. And we certainly can't burn it when we're sitting in front of a computer looking at an Excel sheet. If we're on a bicycle, yeah, then we can burn some sugar. If we're, you know, mowing the yard for three hours, yes, then we could. But when we're not moving, it is very difficult for us to burn it. So what we know is increase of fructose can lead to obesity and weight gain but also type 2 diabetes. Right along with type 2 diabetes comes the metabolic syndrome, which is type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and high serum cholesterol. So we know all of these things, so we really, really want to avoid high fructose corn syrup and sugar in large amounts. So when you see those commercials on TV that say, oh, high fructose corn syrup is no different than sugar and sugar is fine, that there's, that's really not, that's really not true. We really shouldn't be having as much sugar in our diet as we, as we currently are. And I think that the, um, the recommended amount for women is 30 grams of sugar a day. And I think for men it's a little bit more, maybe 40 or 50. But um, it's just a good idea to kind of keep an eye on that. Use fruit for your desserts. Try to have um, lots of other fresh fruit and whatnot in, in your diet rather than sweet foods. Okay, speaking of sweet foods, for dessert, uh, the sixth tip and trick for these 21 reasons and helpers to help you lose weight is dark chocolate. So we're not going to certainly take everything away that's delicious and wonderful that we enjoy. What we've learned about dark chocolate is um, it actually 
uh, has wonderful, wonderful antioxidants, which are really good. They're called the flavanols. The flavanols are really good for your brain. We also know that it has this appetite suppression quality because it triggers that hormone leptin, and it gives us a feeling of fullness and satiety. We only need a little bit of it because it is very rich and delicious, and two squares only has a half a teaspoon of sugar. That's not very much, and two squares are, you know, about this much, two of those little dove chocolates. So dark chocolate is a really nice way to end a meal. It also kind of gives you the feeling of, I've had a treat, I've had dessert, I'm satisfied. So, you know, you're kind of rewarded at the end of your meal instead of a big piece of cake. And um, on page, oh, I thought I had that written down. On page 59, there's uh, 12 reasons in your book, 12 reasons that the dark chocolate is really, really good for you. And I won't go into each and every one of them, but they're all really good. It, it has some really good qualities for, for lowering your blood pressure and cholesterol and being good for your brain and whatnot. But dark chocolate is a really great way to um, have a treat and... Uh, Absolutely, the 60% or greater of the cocoa is the, the very best, but it's actually really good for you, and you can get dark chocolate-covered almonds and dark chocolate-covered blueberries, but the key to it also is to just make sure that you have that two ounces. You do have to use a little portion control, so it does take, it does take some discipline, but dark chocolate is a really good, good way to end your meal with a sweet treat. Okay, number seven. This one is, I think this one is huge. In our food industry, when, we met, when the food industry makes um, snacks and, and treats, they layer flavors. They layer flavors of salt and spice and sweet, and all of those flavors mingled together um, are, very, are very pleasurable to our brain. Our brain really, really likes it. Think of Doritos. Think of they're crunchy, they're salty, they're sweet, they're a little spicy, they're cheesy. I mean, there's a lot of flavors going on there. Think of um, that awesome blossom onion thing that they have at Outback Steakhouse. We've all had that. Um, there's like 2,500 calories, but it's, it's, it's hot and it's spicy and it's sweet and it's crunchy. And there's a lot of flavors going on with that. And what we've learned is when we have a lot of flavors within a food, it is very pleasurable for our brain and we want more. So what we've learned is that when we keep foods simple, now I don't mean boring, but I just mean simple, they, are, they provide more satiety to us. Think of baked chicken, baked sweet potato, baked apple, tossed salad. I mean, very good, very wholesome, but it doesn't have those layers of sweet and salty and fat and spicy that make our brain go, oh, I want some more of that. We have a natural sense of satiety. So, it's, so what we want to do is keep the meals and the snacks flavor simple. Try to avoid those things that are manufactured and have layers of sweet and salty and crunchy because they really, really, they, they really do cause some, cause some trouble for us. So your plan of action is just, you know, stick to simple, basic foods that are very satisfying and go for the whole fresh unprocessed foods. We all know that that's the best for us anyway. We know that, you know, wholesome fresh food is far better for us than awesome blossoms and Doritos. So, you know, we just want to stick to things that are really, really fresh and unprocessed. So how do you break free from the foods industry flavor? Well, the secret is local, fresh, made in your kitchen, simple ingredients, fresh herbs, olive oil, sea salt, those are the things that are much better for us. Okay, number eight, this is a big one, and this goes right along with the whole fructose 
sucrose business is the sugary beverages. Right along, you know, we talked about that, that big study from Baylor. There is a huge link with obesity and soda consumption. If that would, there would be one thing that I would encourage um, families to do as far as children go is just not have soda in the house. It really, there's really no nutritional benefit at all. And it really does have a huge link with obesity. So number eight, this is a no brainer. Dump all sugary beverages. Consuming less sweet drinks cuts down on calories. We do not register fullness when we drink calories. We only register fullness when we eat solid food. So especially this is true with soda. They, and they, they, have, they, they don't have any physical bulk. They provide no nutritional benefit to us. They go straight to your bloodstream. We've got this whole glucose fructose thing going on. The glucose goes to the cell. The fructose has to go to the liver. Once it's in the liver, the poor liver has no other choice but to turn it into triglyceride, store it as fat. And so what we don't know is when we reduce the intake of sweetened beverages, that has a huge impact on weight reduction. So if you are a soda drinker, I know that it is a hard habit to break but it is a very worthwhile habit to break, and once it's broken, you won't miss it. Once it's broken and you drink tea and coffee and water and V8 juice, you won't miss soda. But it takes a while to get that out of your diet. So choose water. What we, you know, water is the best choice for us. Vegetable juice is really, really good. Try not to drink your fruit, fruit, but you can drink your vegetable juice. It's very filling, it's very nutritious, has a low glycemic index. Um, skim milk, soy milk, avoid all the sweet um, beverages. And uh, don't forget about specialty coffee drinks. And, and the diet drinks, they kind of mess with us as well. I would try to stay away from artificially sweetened beverages as well because Artificial sweetened beverages, the, the artificial sweeteners are between 10 and 100 times as sweet as sugar. And what that actually does to your palate is it distorts your palate. When you drink, you know, three Diet Cokes in a day, then a bowl of fresh strawberries don't taste sweet. So it, it really clouds your ability, your palate, to be able to taste naturally sweet foods. The other thing is, is the artificial sweeteners, they're just not very good for us. There's some risks that go along with them. If I were going to tell you one that was probably the best, as a dietitian's point of view, I would have to say it would probably be the stevia plant. You can eat, get the actual plant and grow it and mash it up and put it in tea. And um, you can also purchase stevia. But it's, again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sweetener, so I would just try to steer clear of them as best as you can. Um, number nine, this is my, this is what, this is really, really important. And this is really, really works. Uh, protein. Protein is a combination of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Carbohydrate is a combination of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, as is fat. Fat's got a little different chemical configuration, but both fat and carbohydrate are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And the different part of protein is it has nitrogen. All living things, be it a plant or an animal or a human, build cells out of nitrogen. We have to have nitrogen to build cells. And it's a big molecule. And so what protein does for us, because it's a big molecule and it has a specific job to do, it takes a little while to break down. And that, that ability to be able to take a little while to break down provides us a huge amount of satiety. It balances our blood sugar. So nothing provides a longer lasting and more effective appetite control than protein. Proteins produce a prolonged and steady level of glucose in the bloodstream. And we all know how that feels. You know how you, in the morning when you have um, toast with peanut butter on it? Think about how you feel. There's some protein, there's some fat, there's some whole grains. Think about how you feel that way. And then think about how you feel when you forgot to eat breakfast because you were in too big of a hurry and you got to work and you had a cup of coffee and then they brought in the donuts. And so you had a donut, okay? 
you feel differently. There's a different level of fullness, there's a different level of satiety, and that protein in the peanut butter is what really fills you up and sticks with you over the long haul. It slows down the digestive process. And so because it slows down, it sticks with you longer. The other thing that it does is we make this hormone that's called ghrelin. And ghrelin is actually made in the, um, the lining of the stomach. And ghrelin is what makes us feel hungry. Think of your stomach growling and ghrelin. And protein really calms that ghrelin down. So that's the other part of protein that really um, is, is very filling, is it actually calms that hormone ghrelin down, that your stomach is growling and you're hungry all the time. So you want to have protein with every meal. So included protein at every meal. The ideal intake is like half of your body weight in grams. So if you weigh 125 pounds, you need to have about 60, 62 grams of protein every day in every ounce of protein there's seven grams of protein so you need you know three or four ounces of protein with lunch and dinner and maybe one or two in the morning and absolutely make sure that you get protein for breakfast because when you wake up in the morning you fasted through the night and you desperately need fuel um, those non-breakfast eaters, they really need to eat something by 10 o'clock in the morning. But when you have protein that really, really nails um, hunger and kind of sets you up for a really successful day being able to manage what you're going to eat. So in summary, we call protein nature's diet pill. You want to have protein at every meal and these are the best, the best examples. Um, fish, shellfish, chicken, soy, low-fat dairy, omega-3 eggs. You know, back in the old days, we used to think that eggs weren't very good for us, but we've learned a lot about cholesterol. And as it turns out, the omega-3 eggs are really, really good for us. Omega-3 is one of the best antioxidants for the whole body, for your joints, for your brain, and for your heart. So omega-3 eggs are a really, really good choice. And beans and legumes are also a really nice source of protein. So want to have protein at every meal and definitely want to have when you have a snack in the afternoon. Typically if you eat lunch at noon, it's very difficult to last all the way till dinner. So having a nice little um, snack of an apple and some almonds or an apple and a piece of string cheese in the afternoon, really good, nice little protein, complex carbohydrate combination. Okay, number 10. Never skip breakfast. When we were talking about, you know, just before, we talked about uh, you want to you wanna definitely fuel yourself in the morning because you haven't had anything to eat since the night before. So what we know about our metabolism is we burn the most calories between about 10 o'clock in the morning and about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So it would make sense that that's when you want to feed your body the most calories. So um, you need to have fuel in the morning. It actually gives your metabolism a little boost so that you can burn calories better. People who don't eat breakfast tend to be heavier and they tend to make poor choices throughout the day. So setting yourself up for a really good breakfast that has a combination of complex carbohydrate and protein is very, very wise. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be leftover chili if that's what you like, or it can be, you know, a piece of whole grain toast with almond butter on it, or it can be two omega-3 eggs and um, scrambled with some vegetables. It, it can be a lot of different things. But the secret is complex carbohydrates and protein. Um, focus on protein really, really does help with appetite control. So commit to eating breakfast. Be sure your breakfast includes some protein, fiber and carbohydrates. These are the best proteins. If you've not tried almond butter, it's really good on toast. Really, really good. Um, Greek yogurt is really awesome. It's got probiotics and it's higher in protein than regular uh, yogurt. And probiotics are really good for your immune system. So these are just all, you know, nice examples of getting protein into your diet. And you definitely want to have that with every breakfast. So breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Your grandmother was right. It boosts your metabolism. The breakfast eaters are leaner than the non-breakfast eaters. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say, you non-breakfast folks, but um, you'd, be, you'd be better off by having something pretty healthy by 10 o'clock in the morning. 
and breakfast helps us eat less throughout the day because you have protein with your breakfast and then you're more satisfied through the day and you have better appetite control. All right, number 11, don't go crazy, go nuts. When we think of nuts, back in the old days, you used, we, as a snack, we used to think that they were kind of high in fat and high in calories, but actually they have some really, really good qualities. They are, they've got healthy fat, which healthy fat um, helps with that whole leptin, that feeling of fullness. So they have healthy fat, which is a very slow burning fuel and it keeps us full for a while. They have a nice little source of protein, which is also very, very good for us. And then it also has some fiber. So nuts are a really, really good snack. The only thing that I have to say about nuts is you do have to use some portion control because they are kind of high in calories. So a good rule of thumb is about as much that would fit in the palm of your hand. And they say, you know, I think it's 20 almonds. Well, I typically don't count out 20 almonds, but you know, you can put a small handful in your hand. So we know that it's um, health protection. It, they're good healthy fats, so they're really good for your heart. Um, they have protein, fiber, and fat, and they have um, monounsaturated fat. So uh, nuts are a great snack in the afternoon, moderate handful, and they're all good. You know, every, every uh, you know, few months you find out, you know, there's another nut that's really good. Like, a, like I just read the pistachios are really, really good. And uh, so I would think that um, if you just had the mixed nuts, those would be really good for you. But every, any one that you like are all really good. So do you guys like nuts? Do you like peanuts? Yeah. Do you like almonds? Yeah, pecans, they're good, good, it's good. All right, and number 12, this is the last, this is the last point that we're gonna talk to you about, and this is about sleep. This doesn't really have anything to do with um, nutrition, but what we know about sleep and obesity is that when folks are sleep deprived, they have a, uh, they, they gain weight. And there's a lot of reasons that that, that happens. Um, sleep affects your appetite control, when you have a lack of sleep, it also slows down your metabolism. Your body is tired, it hasn't rested. So then your metabolism just isn't, isn't as, as robust as it would be if it was well rested. We know that hunger boosting hormone ghrelin increases while the hunger quieting hormone leptin decreases when you're not well rested. And that kind of makes sense because you're tired. So your body is saying, feed me, feed me, I need more fuel. Research shows that poor sleep increases cravings for unhealthy food. That kind of makes sense too. If you're exhausted, what do you want? You want you want coffee and you want Cokes and you want donuts and you need energy. So, so uh, all of these things is not surprising. Um, and it also uh, reduces the motivation of energy to exercise. Well, that, that's not a surprise. If you didn't get enough sleep, the last thing you want to do is go and get on the elliptical trainer after work. You want to go home and take a nap after work. So sleep really, really has a very um, important component to weight management. So plan of action, seven to nine hours of sleep is really good. Really, really good. Um, make your room dark, cool, and quiet. Uh, the other thing that we've learned is um, when there are lights on in uh, things like computers or uh, like the, the control box of a TV or a clock that has a light on it, that really is not very good for sleeping. So when you, you want to make sure that your room is nice and dark and nice and quiet, people typically sleep better in those circumstances, although there are those that say that they need the white noise. Actually, we sleep better and more deeply when we have a quiet surrounding. Um, and so avoid close exposure to backlighting. Uh, get regular daily exercise, although I would have to say that the earlier you exercise in the day, the better you rest at night. When you exercise late at night, it kind of um, increases your metabolism, and so it's very difficult to exercise and then go straight to bed. So we do better when we exercise earlier in the day. We also get a better boost of calorie burning opportunity from it because it increases our metabolism, and our metabolism just doesn't come straight down. So you have more of a benefit of that when you exercise earlier in the day. And then minimize the use of prescription sleeping aids, of course. 
So that's what we have today for the first uh, 12 tips and tricks to help you lose weight. Um, next week I will be back and we will cover uh, 13 through 17. So I will see you then. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, I hope that you take this book home, read through it, and then next week we're, we'll get busy and we'll talk about some more. Thank you so much.